Welcome to Bereans at the Gates broadcast for today. It is September the 22nd, 2017. It's a busy day around Cedarville's campus today. We have several hundred visitors, parents and high school students that are determining where they should go to school. Uh, also, our School of Business Administration's Advisory Council is here. So what that means is those of us that have an administrative bent to them are off uh, trying to recruit and doing other things. So today, uh, I am Bert Wheeler. I'm an economist here, the Barry Chair for Free Enterprise. To my immediate uh, right here is Dr. Uh, Mark Clausen. He's a professor of history and law. And then joining us today is Glenn Dewar, Assistant Professor of International Studies at Cedarville. And uh, gentlemen, what I thought we would start out with today uh, is our president's address to the UN General Assembly uh, on, on Monday. What I'd like to ask initially, or for us to talk about initially, is his basic uh, demeanor, the way the speech uh, came off, what you thought about it generally as a, as a speech. Mm -hmm. So Glenn, would you like to start us out? Absolutely. Every year I have the privilege of taking our Model United Nations team to that very assembly, the UN General Assembly in New York. Uh, it is a fascinating building. It's, it's magisterial in many ways. Uh, it's, it's, it's a large hall, and when you look, looked at President Trump delivering the speech, uh, one thing that did not come up much in the mainstream media was simply the placement of the um, ambassador from the Democratic Republic of Korea to the United Nations. He was actually in the front row. It tends to uh, rotate, actually, by, by letter, and he happened to be in the very front seat, and so it was very nerve-wracking for him because he often had his had his face down because President Trump was literally right there. Uh, but it's a big hall, so President Trump, even a large man, would get lost even in the back. Uh, but a, a dynamic speech, it called out a number of uh, countries. And so this speech, it, there's a lot of different reactions already uh, from what he said. Okay, great. Uh, Martin, did you have any impressions? Yeah, let's talk about the tenor of the speech. It was definitely not like a typical speech that you might have heard, except maybe from Iran, maybe. Um, which I've heard some of those in the past. Um, it, it was, it was, uh, it, it didn't follow the typical UN kind of right. uh, process uh, or, or demeanor. Uh, and also, I think though, if you look at afterwards, uh, this speech resonated really well with his base, with Israel, with Southeastern Asia, Asian countries, and even with most Republicans. And as you might expect, it did not resonate well at all with most Democrats. Uh, who were not just critical, but very critical of the speech. I, I personally, I, I liked it. I, I liked seeing his personality in there. I, it sounded to me like something he had had input on, and just the very way it was you know, delivered and the rhetoric that was in there, you know, him calling uh, the Supreme Leader a rocket, <laughs> rocket man, man. <laughs> saying their nations around the world are just going to hell, you know, whatever, whatever that meant. Uh, it, it had his stamp all over it, so oh, yeah. it wasn't like uh, something that someone else had, had written, uh, written for him. In the speech, he, he mentioned that uh, he was not going to react ideologically, but rather according to what he termed principled realism. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you have any, any notion of really what he is referencing? I, I would like to defer to Glenn on that. Okay. Issue. Principled realism, yeah. Uh, realism is one, one of two major schools of thought in international relations theory. Uh, it, it's based largely upon economic and military power. That came across uh, mightily in the speech. Uh, it, it's, it's based on brute objects and brute force. Uh, the critique of that, however, is where's the exit ramp for North Korea? At what point do, are we following a trajectory that will lead us to war, even if North Korea is a bully that needs to be put in its place? There has to be a point somewhere where they give, where he gives North Korea a place to exit because there's a danger in, in fomenting um, violence. And so this is, this is an area where the speech could have been improved uh, but overall, I thought that he uh, laid out a, a bold plan and attempted really to uh, put together a, a hawkish foreign policy stance that I think, as you said, rightly said, Mark, will, will really um, satisfy the base 
and uh, will promote the United States and really the UN system and the liberal world order with military might as, as its backing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, let me just add to that. I agree with Glenn wholeheartedly on what, what, that's what it is, I think. There's a certain element of pragmatism, but in the, in the process of the pragmatism, you, I agree, you have to leave something open so that your choices are not stark mm -hmm. anymore. You know, it's, well, it's either this or war. And I don't think he really desires to go to war. I don't think Donald, now, you could correct, you, you could disagree with me on this, but I don't think Donald Trump really wants to go to war. But on the other hand, I'm not sure he has the experience yet, at least, to figure out how to avoid that in his rhetoric. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I doubt he wants to go to war. I had, as you, you were well, well aware, uh, there were several uh, problems that I had with uh, candidate Trump and now President Trump. <laughs> Uh, most of it had to do with policy, but also I was uh, really worried about this kind of thing. I had, did not have North mm -hmm. Korea in my mind at all. I just didn't know if we had someone with his uh, temperament being that close to that much power, if it would work out. So, uh, you know, Glenn, you've already alluded a little bit to uh, the role that uh, our president's speech has played with, uh, with North Korea. Do you think that it is tangibly changing what's happening, or does uh, Kim realize more that this is our president's uh, style and he likes to sound, you know, carry the big stick initially and then, you know, come, come at you with a toothpick? So does, do you think Kim uh, realizes that, or do you think he's taking this as a more um, direct literal provocation. Yeah, Kim, Kim Jong-un may realize that Donald Trump's style is very much uh, yeah, put everything in, in one basket and then kind of ease off. Like, let's get out of NATO, let's, it's obsolete. Well, let's just have them reach the 2% threshold funding. Um, the challenge with that, though, is he has an internal audience that wants him to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with President Trump, that wants to match him every step of the way. And so while President Trump called him the rocket man, he responded by calling him a donong, which is a, a, an imbecile, a, a senile old man, right. essentially, which will play well to his internal uh, audience and really will show him as standing up to the United States uh, the danger now is that he could conduct a seventh nuclear test, this time uh, another hydrogen bomb in the Pacific Ocean. That would be a major step back in terms of security. But if we also think of environmentalism, it crosses a range of different policy areas. Uh, so I think that he may realize President Trump's style, but not know how to react because he has to stand up to him in order to fend off domestic criticism or potentially some form of coup, because there are signs in North Korea that uh, internal factors could displace him. And if he does not stand up, um, that's a problem for him, potentially. Yeah. So it's likely that what we are doing uh, is actually strengthening uh, Kim's power uh, in his nation. It's, it's, it, it may be strengthening it, but it could be weakening it in another way. We just don't know that much about North Korea. Uh, it's certainly got destabilizing factors, which could go in one of two ways. It could simply remove Kim Jong-un from leadership, at which point there are a lot of open uh, situations, problems potentially. Um, it could be through a coup, uh, at which point what happens to the stability of the country, uh, or it could simply be an assassination, at which point we may see millions of refugees pouring across the Chinese, Russian, and South Korean borders. Uh, there aren't really good options unless there's some form of stabilizing force or some form of unification South Korean government that comes in and does its best in the short term to alleviate a situation. Okay. Yeah. Good, good part about this, by the way, is immediately after that speech, he did, uh, he did issue his executive order mm -hmm. regarding trade business with North Korea. And that sort of tells me he still wants to go in the direction of economic sanctions which is good, and, that, and I think it was, I don't know whether he did this deliberately or not, but whether it was or not, it was a wise decision to do that immediately because otherwise we're stuck again with that rhetoric that's kind of, uh, uh, it kind of emboldens everybody. It raises the temperature for everyone. And with the economic sanctions, that brings it down a little bit without actually compromising. Earlier this week, 
uh, Warren Davidson, the House Representative uh, from uh, District 8 in Ohio, visited our campus. I was able to uh, uh, participate or to have a, a uh, that's what I'm looking for, a little thing where you eat just a little teeny bit of food and stand around and talk. <laughs> did, did that. That's what we and uh, he said that he was on the Financial Services Committee and talked about how they were talking about and thinking about at that time increasing the economic sanctions. And my response to him was, well, what do you think that's going to do? Mm -hmm. And uh, these, I just do not see economic sanctions working for a rational democracy. And I do not see economic sanctions working at all in North Korea. Because generally what, what happens, and uh, there were some moves actually today uh, that, that uh, related to uh, closing up some of the financial yeah. uh, ba banking industries that uh, were de dealing, had dealt with North Korea. But what it really does is it hurts the person that's lowest on the totem pole. Well, and yeah. In North Korea, they're bad now. Yeah, I know. That's, that's a problem. And I, I, don't know how, I don't know how to balance those two against each other, or whether there is a balance, or whether one is right, one is wrong. Um, well, you have to do the lesser before you do the greater, but it, there's an escalation going on here that really picked up this week after our president's speech. Yeah, I, no, I agree with that. And, and the problem is, you're right, the North Koreans at the, at the general level are in terrible shape. It's not just economically, but they're living terribly uh, and they're being oppressed terribly. Will this affect, will this make it worse for them, but not worse for Kim Jong-un? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm, that's I'm what you're saying. I'm certain that, that will occur. So, yeah. so we have an unintended consequence, is what you're saying. I don't know any it's other possible. thing to do, and that's, that's why I told possible. the representative, I'm not, I said, I'm not saying don't do this. Right. But just don't expect, and I don't think this gentleman thought it would be effective either. Uh, okay. Also, while, while he was there, I thought, well, I'm going to ask this guy another question. <laughs> and I said this, can they reach Guam with a nuclear weapon? Oh, yeah. And here's what he said, all right. He thought for a moment and said, I don't believe I'd ought to answer that. Okay. <laughs> this could be yeah. classified. What would happen if North Korea did follow through and did detonate a hydrogen bomb up in the atmosphere in the Pacific, which is, I believe, what they threatened to do last night? What do you think our response would be if that occurred? Wow. There are a few things. Let me go back to the economic sanctions because uh, the average North Korean lives on about $1,800 GDP. Uh, that's GDP per capita. So uh, population of about 25 million, uh, about 48 billion in terms of uh, overall GDP. Uh, so the average North Korean is maybe 125th, one twenty-fifth, uh, one as wealthy as the average American. So very poor. But in Pyongyang, the showcase capital, there's significant wealth in places, and the skyline is improving. There are new buildings going up, so there's economic growth. But there are a couple canaries in the coal mine. Uh, I look at Hamhung, which is the second largest city, but in particular Chongjin, which is the third largest city. And that, in 1994, was the place where uh, the famine hit the worst. I mean, maybe one in five people from Chongjin died. And so economic sanctions, if they're biting, will hit a city like Chongjin. Uh, but in general, there are so many ways around economic sanctions. I like them. I think they're good in general, but I don't think that they've been nearly as targeted as they should be. Mm. In terms of North Korea's intercontinental ballistic missile technology, it has the Hwesong-12 missile that can fly upwards of 3,600 miles. So they can hit Guam. However, the North Koreans have not yet shown the ability to accurately yeah. hit or target a, 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 a medium-range ballistic missile. Uh, and so that is, is something of still of an unknown. We also don't know if they can actually mount, if they have the warhead, mm -hmm. a hydrogen warhead, where they can get it small enough and still make, make the rocket fly, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. We, we don't yet know. It's been presumed that they can miniaturize and then launch it on a, a what would be a Typodong 2 missile uh, ICBM that could, in theory, hit the United States uh, and, and maybe even as far as Washington, D.C., if it was... Uh, uh, capable in that manner. In terms of testing in the Pacific, we have not yet, we have not seen that in, in 20 years. The last time was mm -hmm. 1996 when the French uh, did it. It was just before the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty came into law. If you remember, that was hotly debated in the U.S. Senate. Yes. But basically, it provided a global moratorium on the usage of nuclear weapons. India and Pakistan both tested in the late 90s, but North Korea is the only country that has tested a nuclear weapon in a century. And that's what makes it such a rogue country. 
uh, as well as the inf potential environmental fallout. Uh, if you think of the South Pacific, there are numerous island countries that have been hit in, in uh, very dangerous ways environmentally. And so they were glad to see the CTBT go through. This would be a major step backwards. And yeah. I think it's where coalitions of Republicans and Democrats could come together in terms of uh, environmentalism and military security. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, anything else on uh, what's happening with North Korea? Any, anything else anyone would like to mention? I just don't know. I'm just just don't know what good options we have right now. We, we, if we wait too long, then he could develop significantly better technology. Uh, if we, if we, so so there's a possibility that what we could do is simply attack the nuclear program, not attack the country, but the program itself. Take it out as Israel might might be tempted to do to Iran or somebody like that. Um, would that lead to an all-out war? Would they invade South Korea at that point? What would China do if they invaded South Korea? Uh, would they do anything at all? These are all these unknowns that we just, I, you know, it's just, it's, it's a tough situation. Yeah, there are, there are three examples. Uh, Israel attacked the Osirak reactor in Iraq in 1981. Iraq's nuclear weapons program was centered there. Uh, the al uh center in Syria in 2007, the Israelis likewise. Uh, but in Iran, they've diversified. There are over 130 different nuclear sites. And so it's virtually impossible to hit all of them. North Korea is, is not as diversified as, as um, Iran, but more so than Iraq and Syria, making a unilateral strike very difficult, difficult. to be successful in terms of removing the program. Uh, and then it would almost lead to a war with South Korea 1.1 million in the military, 10 million reservists, yeah. and then you have to think about 28,500 U.S. troops right there. It yeah. would be deadly and, and quick. This, this, could, this is the problem, I fear. Uh, Glenn, did I hear you say that you thought if the economic sanctions uh, had been, uh, you said targeted better, mm -hmm. that it might help lead to a Kim's overthrow? Well, um, the recent round of sanctions that has been implemented, uh, Congressman Davidson working uh, in that area, uh, looked at three countries, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And uh, often in the sanctions, uh, prominent members, even cabinet members of the Putin regime, for example, aren't targeted. Uh, Russia keeps a lot of its money uh, in the United States and in the West. I was just at a hearing from the U.S. Helsinki Commission uh, on Russian disinformation, and one of the big issues is that the Russians can keep their money in the West. And prominent people, even Putin's chief of staff wasn't targeted. So I think that uh, U.S. legislation needs to get much, much more specific in targeting individuals and mm -hmm. companies and entities. And that's the way of stopping the funding. Because otherwise, you're absolutely right. It, it just hits the low person on the totem pole and they end up starving and it doesn't impact the regime. But if you target the sanctions, you could stave off war and uh, make it much more difficult for the illicit money to come into the United States or elsewhere in the West to okay. our allies. Yeah. All right, uh, let's shift gears just a little bit, but keep to a uh, topic that Trump mentioned in, in his address to the United Nations. And it had to do with, uh, with migrants or refugees, individuals that were you know, being forced out of their nation for political reasons or uh, maybe more directly violent reasons. And what he basically said was, we, we want to help you guys. However, we think it's a lot better if we can help you without having to bring you to another country or mm -hmm. let you come over. It's much cheaper. He used a figure of 10 to 1. Right. Well, what do you think about that? Do you think that uh, in terms of, of the refugees yeah. that right. may really need help? Yes. To carve out a, a kind of a homeland for them over there. It's, it's been around for several years now. You're advocating secession? Uh, well, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> I'll make no comment. <laughs> um, that's, that's essentially what he has to, what, what he's saying, mm -hmm. right? Some kind of a homeland for them there. Um, otherwise, the United States is going to be pressured to take them in. Right. He doesn't want to do that. That's not part of his immigration program as a whole. Uh, no matter how good a citizen he thinks they are, the base again is going to determine part of that. And uh, so this is a difficult one, I think. Uh, I mean, I don't mind the idea, by the way, of having a homeland, if it works. The problem is, will it work, right? 
you have all sorts of problems that you run into. Could people just ignore that? Right? Other nations just ignore it. Could the nation in which they're located simply not want it, of course, and refuse to cooperate at all? Um, any, any of those variables is just going to make the whole thing moot. So it's a nice idea if it works. Yeah, it stems back to the uh, really presidential debates in the primaries. Uh, I'm a conservative generally, but one of my big concerns with the Republican primary debates is that they did not, they advocated this idea of, well, just create a safe space in the Middle East and don't let refugees in. But there was that never any real plan behind it. There was never a specification. And so in my view, if there's a major global tragedy, either you have to do something like let some refugees in or you have to physically get involved if you're the size of the United That's States. And so in terms of my own academic research and the uh, policy proposals that I put forth, I think decentralization of some countries is a big mm -hmm. one where you can create uh, provinces with a lot of autonomy. Take the Iraqi Kurds, for example. They have been a very, very good international stakeholder. They're holding a, a referendum this weekend on independence. Uh, if that could become a safe space for refugees or a, a land space in close proximity there, uh, you might not have to uh, create new countries, right. uh, but that is yeah, another like option too. Uh, there are dangers, of course, of, in terms of fiddling with sovereignty of other countries, yeah. but when the central government fails its citizens and uh, they're starving or fleeing their countries, something has to be done that's more tangible. And the opportunity there is some form of confederal structure mm -hmm. in terms of governance, which will allow for security apparatus and the protection of minorities. Or you simply go the step further and allow, in very specific cases, uh, sovereignty, secession to occur, mm -hmm. uh, again, with international stakeholders that are responsible and can stabilize the area rather than making it further disintegrate. When you say secession, though, yeah. you're talking about secession that is from the country of which they're being oppressed. So it's not yes. like they move over yes. to some other turf. Yes, because I, I think in terms of God-ordained governance, if, if you as a leader are killing your own people, you've, you've lost your uh, ability to govern. I think you're right to govern. Lost your credibility. Uh, and so in those types of cases, I would actually go as far as advocating first decentralization, mm -hmm. but then if it doesn't work, secession and simply allowing uh, minority groups, a state app apparatus in which to protect themselves and to mollify the overt tensions within the region. And it's a way potentially of solving Syria and Iraq simultaneously, mm -hmm. and maybe even allowing the Russians uh, kind of a fig leaf of, giving, of keeping uh, Bashar al-Assad in power, but whilst also dividing and protecting Christian Yazidi and other Shia minorities, for example. Totally different yeah. setting, but what about the situation in Myanmar now? Do you think there's any possibility of that kind of a solution? Uh, absolutely. I've been to Myanmar twice. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating country. It's uh, basically been at civil war since its independence in 1948. There are literally dozens of ethnic groups around its periphery. The treatment of the Rohingya uh, Muslim minority is, is abhorrent. Uh, and, and really a better solution needs to take place. I don't think they're at a place where we'd simply say, uh, divide things, but I, I think some decentralization, some recognition of the Rohingya, uh, some ability to live their lives uh, within a, a certain zone and area and flourish economically would be a good solution and a step forward. Uh, because right now what we have is a, a Nobel Prize, Prize winner, Aung San Suu Kyi, that's the de facto head of government in Burma, that is really allowing a genocide or ethnic cleansing to take place. Uh, and as Christians, looking at people who are made in the image of God, uh, I think it's our responsibility to advocate for them and to present governmental level solutions. And I think that's one. I think Glenn too, picking up on what Glenn said, the Christian, it's consistent with the Christian worldview to do it this way too. That's this way you don't have a revolution, you have a legal mechanism for either, either creating some, some safe space, federalizing in a sense, or confederalizing, or actually starting a new government, that's a, that's a legal process. You're no longer violating that whole notion of Romans 13, right, in effect. Mm. 
it would be an interesting topic for another day, exactly. Yes. Uh, when, uh, <laughs> uh, as you say, when does the government lose the uh, right to govern and, and when does well, yeah, the law I mean, not, not become that's valid? That's a fast yes. We're not going to be able to get into that <laughs> okay. today. What I, what I would like to do, we're just about out of time. And there are, there are some things, Mark, that are going on in our uh, Congress right now, spe specifically within the Senate. Uh, could you outline for us the reconciliation rules? Now, I don't want, I don't oh, think boy. today, well, just yeah. real, real simply. <laughs> today, I don't want to get into either tax reform yeah. or Graham Cassidy health, the health uh, care yeah. bill that they're talking about. But could you just set the stage for next week? Yeah. Why do they have to vote? Why does the Congress, why does the Senate have to vote by September 30th? Well, ma the main thing is that the reconciliation rule applies to any, any kind of bill that has to do with, with budget issues, right. money issues. So if they're dealing with anything right now that has to do with money issues, this is their chance to do it before, they, before something else comes up. And with a simple majority. Impact. With a simple majority. You don't need the 60 uh, filibuster rule. Uh, so if they don't do that, then the time expires to do that. Right? And, and then you have to have the 60 votes to continue the, to continue the debate. Um, and and, and right. this, is, this is kind of arbitrary, too. Because oftentimes we'll ask for the opinion of the House parliamentarian, and he will—he's not always sure. Is, is this—is this a budget issue, money issue, or is this not a money issue? There always there's always an overlap between the two, the of substantive course, issues the and the money issues. Is a money issue. That's certainly a money issue. And certainly, you could argue that uh, at least partial repeal of uh, Affordable Care Act is a money issue. You could partial the partial. Now, when it gets into the substance without the money, then the House parliamentarian could rule against them. Right. And it also factors in uh, Harry Reid's nuclear option <laughs> in terms of the change of right. the Senate rules. Uh, Mitch McConnell recently implemented a, a similar type measure, uh, meaning it's potential that we could see 51 members voting in favor, uh, which would get rid of the, the filibuster. So that's, that's another potential outcome if the Republicans decided to take the if nuclear option again. If they did. Okay. And, and they might be well ready, they might well be ready just to do that. I mean, I'm seeing increasing frustration, mm -hmm. uh, frankly, on both sides. It's, it's true. interesting. The uh, progressives now, just in the last day or two, are starting to come out and with <laughs> fire over, uh, over Graham Cassidy. So. Let, let me make a point, one All more right. point on this. Um, this is my personal opinion on it. Since the U.S. Constitution says nothing about this filibuster rule, 60-vote rule, I would prefer simply not to allow those kinds of internal rules right. that fiddle with the actual majoritarian process that the Senate and the House of Representatives originally were tasked with. That's my own preference. Do away with that. Now, I know it has its benefits in certain cases. It's pragmatically beneficial in some cases, but I don't think it's consistent with the spirit of the Constitution. Okay, well, on that note, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for being with us today, and Lord willing, next week we'll plan to delve deeper into Graham-Cassidy and tax reform. Thank you.